Hi, and welcome to Concussion Talk Podcast. I'm Nick Mercer. This is episode 69. I'll be talking about innovation and rehabilitation with Modus Nova CEO David Wu and Director of Clinical Research, Dr. Nick Housley. Concussion Talk Podcast is presented by HeadCheck Health. HeadCheck Health bridges the gaps in concussion care through simple, powerful technology. To our organizations like the Canadian Football League, Track Factory Racing, the Canadian Junior Hockey League, Eastern Washington University, and Volleyball Canada, who rely on HeadCheck Health to improve communication and optimize care. Visit HeadCheckHealth.com for more. I'm joined by CEO Dave Wu and Director of Clinical Research Dr. Nick Housley of Modus Nova. And Dave Wu, can you just please introduce yourself and talk about it, just give us a bit of a background and talk about what Modus Nova is for everyone else out there. Sure, yeah, thank you so much for having us. Um, uh, my name is David Wu, I, I, I am the CEO of Modus Nova, um, and we make a uh, telehealth robotic device uh, for physical therapy. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to be here today and, and we're uh, hoping to, to talk about telehealth and, and what we do. Yeah, can you give us a bit of background on where, where, did, you, where, did, where did you go to school and do your business or scientific background? Sure, sure, yeah. So um, I uh, studied chemistry um, and um, in operations uh, on the business side. Um, so I kind of uh, straddled straddle both sides of the fence on, on both the science and, and the business side. Um, at, uh, at Emory, um, and uh, uh, ever since um, I've been an entrepreneur, so I've uh, I've done. A, this will be my third startup, um, and uh, it's yes. been uh, quite the wild ride. Um, ups, both the ups and the downs. And we guys are in Atlanta, Georgia. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Uh, is that where you guys are both from, or did you just move to Atlanta because you were just from Atlanta? Well, that's that's a good yeah that's a good question. Um, I grew up mostly in the Northeast, uh, upstate New York, um, and uh, in in Connecticut. Um, and I, I uh, moved uh, to Atlanta um, at this point about ooh, about 14, 15 years ago, um, and uh, uh, been calling myself a uh, Atlantean ever since. <laughs> nice. So where where is Emory University? Is that in Atlanta? That's right. Yes, Emory, Emory University is in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. That's right. Okay, and uh, Dr. Housey or Nick, as I would say, this one's a good name, late name. Fine. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Nick, for having us. What, so what, what is your role, your background, and your role at, at uh, Modus Nova? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Dr. Nick Housley. Um, my role at Modus is the director of clinical research and development. Um, so that's basically anything that involves sort of scientific background, anything that involves making sure the devices and the interventions are clinically appropriate, um, and also helping kind of bridge the gap between our clinical partners who are using our device um, for telehealth use now, um, and the, the patients and our, um, our engineering teams. So I kind of um, straddle those, those arenas. Um, Great. Yeah, and, and my background is a little bit different than Dave's. Um, I'm actually a physiologist by training. Um, so my undergraduate degree uh, was in physiology. And then I went and got a, um, a doctorate of physical therapy. Um, and um, that's kind of where actually I originally uh, met Dave at this point. Um, we, uh, Dave was running some of the clinical trials um, and uh, that I was involved in as a, as a, as a student. Um, and we started working together back then um, on the device. Um, and then I, after I, I completed that degree and did some practice, I um, went and got a PhD in neuroscience um, and um, primarily study um, sort of sensory motor control of um, limb function. Um, so I kind of got some of the basic science and clinical science um, behind oh, okay. the device's use. Um, yeah. Very useful. So. I guess, uh, Dave, if you tell us about this, what is this? I've seen the hand mentor and the foot mentor. Yeah. And is that, is that, what are those devices and are there any other stuff that 
same genre? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. So, um, like you said, our our two two main products are the hand mentor and the foot mentor. Um, we describe them as uh, robotic exoskeletons or robot exoskeletons. Uh, it's really just a fancy way of saying um, it's something that you wear um, that that is. Uh, um, uh, on, on your limb, so the hand mentor onto your hand and arm, and the foot mentor around your, your foot and um, uh, your ankle. Um, and then the robotic part simply means that it's capable of moving on its own. Um, it's uh, capable of uh, uh, helping you uh, with movement. Um, so the, the really therapeutic part about uh, what, what we're able to do is that uh, we're able to, uh, much like a real life physical therapist or a th- I should say a in person much like an in person physical therapist can help and move you through therapeutic exercises in a uh, rehabilitation setting um, we're able to replicate the physical elements of that uh, with our our robotic device um, and uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get to this later um, but uh, yeah our current application is, is really exciting and we're, um, what we're doing is we're serving as a telehealth platform um, where uh, having our ro- robotic our robots uh, controlled remotely by clinicians um, who are then able to practice physical therapy at a distance um, especially in these kind of uh, uh, times where um, you know, infection control and, and uh, access is, is, a, is a big concern. Oh, yeah, actually, that's very, very apt because I was just going to ask you about both about the uh, telehealth and the AI robotic devices. So if you both kind of attack it from a different angle, as in David, you can tell us you know, what it actually is and like what, it, what it, the product is, and Dr. Housie, Dr. Nick, I know it's called Nick. Nick is, yeah, that's um, fine. Um, Nick, uh, just what what it means to a to a physiotherapist or a, any any clinician really who's using it. So, I guess uh, Dave, could yeah. you tell us what what it is what it the how they work together to help? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the spot thing Absolutely. So um, you know, I'll start with just kind of more of the kind of the, the practical wrapper, and I think Nick can kind of talk more about the the clinician experience and. Telehealth, it's, it's not a new concept. It's something that, that uh, we've been practicing for, for a, a very long time, many years. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's evolved over, over time. Um, uh, and today, what telehealth really means um, is a, uh, to most people, I should say, telehealth to most people in most instances, it's a, uh, a video chat um, between a clinician um, and a patient. And typically, what would happen is a patient would describe, "Oh, this, you know, this is what's wrong with me," and maybe the clinician can ask some questions. And uh, many of those telehealth sessions um, result in, "Okay, um, you know, I will, as a clinician, maybe I'll prescribe something or ask you to do something differently, um, or maybe you know, this is serious and you need to come in." Um, really, what it is, a lot of these telehealth sessions are just assessments. Um, they're kind of a, a step one to uh, step two, uh, step three uh, in, in the healthcare chain. Um, kind of the only uh, uh, area maybe is um, uh, 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 psychiatry or psychology where um, uh, the treatment itself, both the assessment and the treatment, um, it can be done um, just by, uh, through, through a, many, a, much, a lot of the treatment can be done, I should say. Um, through just kind of talking um, and and, uh, uh, and speaking with each other, um, so uh, yeah, and that's that's kind of what we really emphasize. <clears throat> Excuse me, that um, uh, telehealth currently for physical therapy, um, it, the needs are a little bit different, right? Um, rather, uh, if you compare that to a psychology or psychiatry, um, the treatment. Um, is talking uh, or, or, or uh, having conversations on one side. In physical therapy, um, you really need to, uh, m- much of it involves some kind of uh, physical movement, uh, um, uh, uh, touching uh, and, and moving, uh, the clinician touching and moving the patient. And that tactile part is, is so important um, to, to both the experience of the patient and the experience of the clinician. Um, and, and what we're doing here with our uh, exoskeleton robot is we're able to replicate 
that that uh, uh, that the physical tactile element of both um, uh, being able for the clinician to move the patient and uh, for the clinician to uh, sense the patient, right? Um, and and uh, 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 see as a clinician, I want to assess if I were if I wanted to assess how impaired a patient was. Um, uh, you can't, it's really difficult to do that through a video chat, um, just kind of visually watching someone. Um, uh, being able to measure the forces and, and the movements of someone um, uh, through our device, kind of through all the sensors that we have on our robot, um, that can re really recreate this uh, patient clinic experience. And, and that's kind of, uh, um, you know, what, what we really bring, Modus Nova brings to the table um, with, the, with the hand mentor, with the foot mentor, um, to uh, really make uh, telehealth for physical therapy something that matches, <clears throat> excuse me, matches the experience of physical therapy in, in a real life clinic. Right. Yeah, and I just quickly add on to that, Dave. I think you're you're exactly right. This um, the evaluative process, um, the PTOT eval uh, that traditionally happens in the clinic is a very very difficult thing to replicate in in a telehealth platform um, where you can't have hands on patient, you can't feel end feel of a joint, you can't feel resistance to movement, um, and and as you said, the sensors can can really help augment um, those 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 gaps. Um, but the device, since it was originally conceptualized to be, or incept, uh, I guess developed to be an interventional tool, the device really shines in its ability to deliver interventions remotely. Um, so just as a quick background, I mean, the, the background of the device is that um, the scientists and the engineers were uh, uh, chiefly involved in the development of constraint-induced movement therapy. Or this is probably some of the oh, best... Sorry, sorry, Nick, can you just read that last point of the the device was that time when there. Sure, sure, so, yeah. So, um, yeah, no worries. Yeah, so the device was originally inspired by constraint-induced movement therapy. Um, people yeah. may have heard of this as a CIMT, um, and this was um, some of the the best sort of most effective evidence we have for um, for the, the capacity of the brain to rewire after a neurologic injury. And these scientists, after figuring out that um, these interventions worked, um, quickly realized that it just doesn't work in, in terms of like our, our, our normal insurance uh, um, sort of healthcare um, industry in the United States. So this just happened to be along the same lines as when um, sort of the technical elements of robotics were meeting healthcare. And they designed these, these tools to help um, sort of supplant or, or augment um, what was being done in the CIMT uh, approaches, where the device is used to help basically amplify the number of movements that someone has or help them get the number of re repetitions to actually induce those positive changes. So the device really does shine, uh, not only in the, in the evaluation, but also in the capacity to deliver um, highly effective therapies. Um, so that what, I, I think, what I think is so cool is that the use of, well, tell health is obviously it's important like, right now today because of the COVID concerns and the social physical distancing and things, but the use of AI as well, so that people can actually use this. We can be exercises can be given by by physicians and by not physicians, but by clinicians, physiotherapists and OTs, and, and they can have that. Has that where they they program the device remotely, or they just say, yeah, "I want you to do this type of movement." Yeah, that's exactly right. So, I mean, one of the largest concerns now is that um, it's actually a two-sided problem, right? Um, one side is a lot of these in, these clinicians are are being furloughed or they're not actually having right. access um, to their patients because maybe their institute or their clinic has um, has some rules now to keep the density of people in a, in a given space lower. Um, and so they're not able to use their skilled services to help people that need it. And, and what Nick me, yeah, means by that, we were, you know, this is just one example. I think last week we were, um, uh, I was talking to a, a, a clinic manager. Um, they were able to bring uh, three or four patients in uh, at the same time simultaneously and have uh, uh, three or four clinicians treat them. Uh, but now because of uh, laws, state laws on, on distancing, that clinic can only have one individual there. 
um, at a time. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and of course, this is going to be different from every clinic depending on how we, how these clinics are situated. Uh, but because of distancing requirements, um, you can see a, um, sometimes a having uh, of of the capacity of some of these clinics, and um, that's both uh, a, an issue for clinicians um, and and for patients. Yeah. So um, we have a, this, this kind of two sided problem, and um, having an ability to um, sort of extend the reach, um, be able to operate outside of a standard clinical environment is really, really valuable because those people on both sides need, need to deliver their services um, and they also need to, to access that care. And so how this kind of works in practice is, you know, you're exactly right, Nick. Uh, what ends up happening is the therapist, once they get engaged with a, a patient, um, um, they, they establish secure connections and they perform an evaluation. Um, you can imagine this very much like a standard PTOT visit. Um, you're going to have some portion of that time we're going to be talking about um, what's kind of going on, um, uh, you know, history of your disease, um, what kind of movement limitations, what kind of goals you have. Um, and then you go into um, objective movement screening um, where you can use the audiovisual feedback on the platform as well as the kinematic and kinetic feedback. And what those terms mean are basically kinematics is movement. So kind of range of motions, those types of things. And kinetics is like the forces applied. So we can figure out with the device on someone's limb, we can figure out how much they can move, how strong their muscles are, and where they may need help. And with that information, it's kind of consolidated and presented to the clinician, the, the provider. Um, they can use that information to develop treatment programs that will help that individual increase their range of motion, increase their strength, um, and increase um, functional capacity of their arm or, or, or leg in this case. Um, so it's very much like a standard kind of um, therapy session. It's just now instead of your hands being directly on the individual or your eyes being directly on them, you just have the sort of intermediary of the audiovisual from the device and the, um, the device being able to tell um, how they're moving. Yeah, and, and, and uh, the, the clinician during this in-person session is able to, to watch all of this uh, data coming from the device, all, uh, how... Uh, so, so they use this so it's in person as well as remotely. They can. Yeah. That, that's correct. Yes. Uh, and, and, and it's, yeah, uh, we've, our device is uh, uh, used, um, has been used over uh, the past five, ten years um, in uh, hundreds of clinics uh, all over the U.S., uh, in person um, uh, specifically. And uh, we've essentially, uh, 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 because this is a robot device, um, we are, and it's cloud connected, um, uh, we have been able to replicate all of the in-person uh, uh, experience, um, but have kind of the readouts rather than it be on the screen itself of the in-person device, have that readout be on a, uh, the screen of a, a clinician in a, in a remote location. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, you, we have patients that will travel uh, uh, to a specific clinic to get um, rehab with our robot therapy device. Um, and now uh, they don't have to do that because we can send the robot therapy device to the home. And, and have that same right. have that same experience and and I want to answer your question about uh, you know, something you had mentioned earlier about the AI um, you know so so uh, just as Nick said in the the session that is done with the clinician the clinician is able to, to essentially program um, uh, 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 the device the hand mentor the foot mentor to match uh, what the clinician thinks are the best suited needs of each individual um, you know let's say, that uh, um, uh, 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 Johnny, uh, uh, just, just, just pulling yeah. at uh, a patient Johnny, um, is able to move um, 10 degrees uh, of movement, um, uh, uh, let's say up and down, uh, five degrees up and five degrees down. Uh, five degrees into flexion and, and extension, maybe um, terms that um, uh, the clinicians would use. Um, and then um, uh, the clinician can assign exercises, assign uh, 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 therapeutic uh, uh, interventions based on that information to move that, that five degrees in, uh, up and five degrees down. Um, and then uh, later after the in-person session, uh, when if Johnny logs back onto the device on his own because Johnny want, you know, is, a, is a rock star and wants to do more hours of therapy, 
uh, Johnny can uh, 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 continue to do the exercises assigned. Um, and, uh, 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 and by the way, all this is accountable, right? The, the, the clinician can see if, if Johnny's doing his homework um, um, that, that's been assigned to him. Um, um, all they the while... They do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah and, and, and uh, I mean, uh, there's no... Uh, this is something we always say. There's, this is a little bit of tangent. But there's no magic pill to physical therapy. As, as anyone that's gone through physical therapy can tell you, yeah. there's no secret words, there's no, there's no password, there's no black magic that you have to put in the hours. I mean, for better or for worse, it's about the amount of practice you do. Um, it's just like going to Carnegie Hall. Um, uh, maybe that's a mannerism. <laughs> it's just like being a, a concert violinist, right? Practice, practice, practice. That's how you get there. Um, same, very much very similar with uh, uh, physical therapy. Um, and uh, so when, J when Johnny's doing these practice sessions um, and, and all of a sudden uh, Johnny moves instead of his, his typical five degrees up, uh, maybe he moves seven degrees up. Uh, and uh, if Johnny were just at home doing us in with a stretch band or you know some something else, uh, some some let's say dumb device, not a smart device, um, no one would notice that. But in this case, on, on the, the hand mentor, the foot mentor, on the, on the modus devices, um, that seven degrees would be immediately be captured by the AI. And then the clinician could have said, you know, okay, you know, if Johnny can exceed these bounds that I've initially set, if Johnny's able to hit seven degrees, the device will automatically make the uh, exercise, adjustment, yeah. uh, the adjustment to make it more challenging. Um, so that Johnny's now having to do seven um, to complete to, to, to complete each of his uh, 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 movement cycles, um, and right. and this kind of con it's like having a, a personal trainer that is always there and, and watching and making sure that um, the practice that you're getting um, is is very the most efficient and effective it can be, uh, so that you can reach your your movement. Yeah, goals. I think what you're talking about, Dave, is basically this idea of um, the sufficiency of the stimulus. Right, we yeah. talk about the, the the dose is really really important for improving. Um, your functional use of your extremity, and making sure that the intensity of the exercise that you're doing is of sufficient quality yep. is is really, really important, right? Things have to be challenging enough um, to drive a change. Um, otherwise, you're not ever going to get the appropriate stimulus to, to make those changes. Um, and so having that ability to constantly monitor um, it's not only in the up too, right? Um, what happens if you're an hour into a, a therapy session um, and you start to experience some fatigue, right? What can happen then is um, your, your motor performance may go down slightly. Um, the device can detect that and can accommodate it in the opposite direction where right. it will start to make it a little bit easier. Or provide more assistance. Provide more assistance, exactly. Um, and, uh, and that's simply because uh, one of the most important factors here is not how much you can do day to day or day, within one day. It's about how much you can do over the long haul. And staying motivated is exceptionally important. Yeah. And if you can continue to see some successes in the day, even when you are fatigued, that will give you more motivation to continue um, the next day and the day after. And I think one thing that you're kind of just touched on here, Dave, is that we didn't really talk about the device, kind of the assistance capabilities. Maybe you want to talk about that as well, um, about, you know, it actually has, um, so we, Dave suggested there are some sensors on board yeah. the device where it can basically digitize your motion as far as capturing these, these kinematic data. Uh, but then the device also has the ability, an externalized muscle, um, the assistance ca capabilities to help, um, you know, for the clinicians um, listening, um, it would be effectively like removing the effect of gravity or helping to remove some of the tone um, that may impair someone from extending their wrist and hand. Yes. Yeah, so, it's, so it's like, a, just, just as Nick was saying, it's, it's an air muscle that's on board. It's a pneumatic muscle. That's just a fancy way of saying it. it's, an, it's an air muscle. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. air muscles are nice because... Uh, they provide a very gentle force that can be resisted. Mm -hmm. um, you can you can push back against it. Um, and it's very very low likely to actually induce a, uh, a spasticity or it really um, um, aggravate tone. That's that's right. Yeah. It's it's like a um, um, yeah. It's like a balloon if you can imagine, um, and that you can uh, uh, it, it's pushing you in a certain. Uh, 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 
direction and, and for you know for the hand for the foot and uh, extension and deflection um, and, and various movements um, but it, it can be it can be resisted it can be pushed back against and um, it's not jerking you around the movement is gradual um, and uh, it's not kind of this uh, robotic like uh, you know uh, you, you might you might uh, when, I, when we say robot you might think of a, on an assembly line these these robots zipping around um, that's that's uh, that's a linear actuator those are electric motors um, they're great for Teslas. They're great for cars, um, but not not great for uh, for physical for therapy, rehab, yeah. right? Um, uh, for for small gradual movements. Um, so so uh, no, thank you, Nick. Um, that active, what we call active rehabilitation, um, but really what what that means is uh, the device is capable of of moving you, um, of moving the user, and that's completely adjustable um, based on uh, the clinician as to how much of assistance um, to give. Uh, and, and kind of the, the analogy I like to use, it's, it's like training wheels. It's like when you learn to ride a bicycle. You have training wheels that kind of help you uh, complete uh, kind of this, this uh, 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 movement or this, this, this skill that you're trying to, um, to learn. And then over time, you want to gradually take away the training wheels uh, because if you're providing too much assistance all of the time, at a certain point, um, uh, you're not going to be, it's the, the training is not going to be effective in, in getting you to get better. Um, and uh, so, but you don't want to also remove the training wheels too quickly, right? Because that will be too much of a, of a, a cliff. Yeah, yeah. Too much of a um, so it's yeah. really key how uh, that, that, we, that we keep the assistance and, and uh, the, the goals appropriate to the users at all times uh, between days as maybe they get better. And like Nick said, even within a day where typically somebody's performance will uh, maybe- will ebb and flow. Well, yeah, well, uh, uh, based on maybe they're warming up and they'll yeah. get a little bit better. And then at the, and later on, they'll get tired and, and they won't be able to do as much. And it's, it's really important that you kind of uh, uh, you, uh, uh, dynamically adjust all of the, the various variables of, of assistance, resistance, um, how much movement is being done, the intensity, all of that um, to the specific user. And, we, and that entire adjustment is done by the machine entirely, and, and we call that AI. I mean, mm -hmm. we, that, 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 that artificial intelligence is what handles all that decision making. Um, as to what is best uh, mm -hmm. for that individual user. Yeah, and that's also, I mean, if we're talking about like how um, clinicians can benefit from that, right? I mean, I guess may, maybe AI is maybe a scary term for some clinicians who are not used to um, this type of technology, but it can really actually provide some valuable um, help um, for the, the providers mm -hmm. here. Yeah, that uh, thing too. Oh, the data is oh, yeah. incredible. Uh, I mean, we're sampling, um, I mean, just, uh, um, I'll just, Pose a, a pose a, a typical example here is you know if you go and you do an evaluation you may put a goniometer on someone uh, one or two times. And, and to, and to quick to, to quickly interrupt Nick, oh, what you're describing here is a a typical in person, in -person exactly yep. uh, usual uh, without a robotic device yep. what you would see in physical therapy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so in, during these evaluations you may get a few um, sort of snapshots of someone's range of motion. Right when you put them on a table you check a hip range of motion. You know you check um, yeah. range of motion maybe even a, a full a full body screen um, but those are only snapshots right um, it's just that day and, and it's just that, that day, day exactly that yeah day. and so but but having the the instrumentation that's on the individual day in and day out for many many hours uh, and we're sampling uh, uh, those movements and those forces something like 50 times a second we're able to get not only snapshots but we're able to get time series of data and to figure out how their movement is changing as we do different interventions. And so that insight can give a lot of feedback to the provider so they can adjust their, their decision making. Maybe I want to try X and see what the response is or try Y and see the response is. They can then modify their practice to individuals on a much more granular level. Um, and also, too, I'd say that the AI is, is valuable because maybe they, they can sort of dip their toe into the data as much as they want to. They don't necessarily have to go full in data scientist and go look at all the time series. Maybe they, they want to look at the summary statistics to start with and see, hey, on aggregate, what's happening? What's their response to X, Y, and Z? Um, yeah. So it kind of uh, it has a spectrum of involvement. Uh, but yes, yeah, certainly the data is a, is a, is a valuable add to the, the provider's um, tool bag here. Yeah, our, really our goal is to present as much data and control to the clinician as 
much as possible mm-hmm. within the limited time frame that the clinician has to spend with each individual. Um, it would be great if um, you know Johnny's uh, 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 OT uh, can can be with him every day uh, of you know eight hours a day, and this is kind of yeah. what going back to constraint induced movement therapy yep. these, these trials kind of tried to do. That would be ideal. That would be the perfect world kind of situation. There just aren't that many clinicians right. out there. there just <laughs> physically aren't that many people. The, yeah, we, we, uh, that's, money yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's the reality that, that we, that we're in. So our, our goal with this, this robot is for the clinician to do kind of the high level thinking that the, the, the decision making, um, and, uh, and then let the robot, uh, uh, after it's programmed, like take uh, those commands and execute them, right? Yeah, right. On, a, on a daily basis, an hourly basis, second basis. Yeah, kind of yeah. And if you can imagine, it's like uh, um, if you're directing, uh, uh, um, if you're directing cars or directing traffic, the the, the clinicians, you know, telling or where an orchestra, car, an orchestra, sure, or an orchestra. That's, yeah. that's good. An orchestra. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the conductor is is uh, kind of giving these large movements and as to how we're going to proceed, but it's up to the individual violinists. To, uh, to make a decision on how to play their, their instrument. Mm-hmm. We want to take away some of this burden from clinicians with the AI um, so that we can replicate as much as we can this uh, uh, constant uh, experience uh, while having the clinician um, uh, being respectful yep. of the clinician's time. Yep. Uh, I, want, I want to ask you as well about, about your interest in, in brain injury, but before I do that, you've talked a little bit kind of all and Orchestra and stuff. So, who's the uh, who's the violinist or your advantage for a piano player or whatever? Uh, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a cellist. I played it in symphony um, back in the day. It's been it's been it's been a while, but uh, yeah. And uh, I, I guess I, I I played the piano though. It's been many years. <laughs> it's been many years. So that's not something I, I think I freely admit to anymore. Yeah. It's yeah. like the analogy, dude. Oh yeah. I'm, also, if, any, if, any, if anyone goes to MarsNova.com, they'll see that Palapa is just, just like straight up, threw right away, it's brain injury and stroke. So was this device inspired by that, or was this incidental that you decided that, oh, this will work for that, we wanted to make this device and this device broke up for brain injury people? Was it brain injury from stroke survivors? Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a great question. Um, so so the, the technology, behind Modus Nova, uh, behind the hand mentor. Um, these clinical trials that were done by these scientists and these engineers, they were tailored specifically, uh, originally they were t- tailored specifically uh, for, for brain injury. Uh, because what they saw was that so many of these individuals with brain injuries, such as a stroke, uh, such as a traumatic brain injury, there were so many of these individuals uh, that were getting undertreated. That they, the, the, the healthcare system was not getting them all of the rehab that they needed. Um, it, whether that be the insurance company uh, uh, that, that, that denied additional treatments um, or just the, the impact of yeah, not enough providers of, yeah, of, of scheduling yeah. or, or driving to or accessing uh, care. Um, that yeah. was a, such a big problem. That uh, the I know as a brain injured person, that's some of this difficulty. Yeah, get access to care because of the translation and just getting there. Absolutely, absolutely, um, and and so much so that the U.S. government, uh, by the uh, 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 National Institutes of Health, um, uh, funded some of these initial research studies into how can we solve this problem of this vast undertreatment, um, and can we solve that with a a, a robot? And this research kind of uh, started in the early 2000s, 2003, 2004, uh, the, where, where, where the idea of this uh, 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 using a robotic intervention um, to, 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 to address some of this undertreatment um, uh, started. And so, 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 so to your question, yes, very much uh, brain injury is at the inspiration and the heart of what makes our device uh, what it is today. Um, but as uh, the scientists developed uh, uh, these uh, devices and talking to other clinicians, uh, 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 clinicians that treated uh, orthopedic injuries or, or, or maybe even um, uh, uh, repetitive use injuries like a, like a carpal tunnel or something like that, these other clinicians said, hey, you know, 
uh, what you guys have here, what this 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 technology you have, it can I can really see it uh, uh, being used and specifically to address uh, my patients that have uh, maybe um, tennis elbow. Um, or, or other conditions. Um, so, uh, um, and so I guess to, to bring this all together, um, what we're finding out from feedback from clinicians is that uh, uh, even though this was inspired for brain injury and stroke survivors uh, uh, specifically, um, it really uh, can be applied to and is currently being applied to in some cases with some clinicians to all sorts of other uh, injuries, ranging from sports injuries to, to, to uh, repetitive use injuries. And, uh, well, and Nick, uh, did, you, did you use these devices or these computer interventions, robotic interventions, when you were studying either physical therapy or neuroscience? Yeah, very much so. Um, yeah, so back in, I guess, it's been a while now, but um, even in 2013 to probably 2017, we were using these devices um, in academic um, and clinical interventions where we were, we were studying, you know, uh, specific sort of hypothesis-driven questions, as well as some of these large sort of, they call QI trials or quality improvement trials to improve the quality of care um, in various institutes. And so we were using these devices um, in the real world. Um, and we were using these specifically, you know, you, you brought up sort of um, um, scheduling and, and, you know, traveling constraints. We, we had these studies in a, a large partnership and a, sort of a long-term partnership with the Veterans Administration in the United States, the VA, um, where these, these devices were specifically used to overcome many of those barriers. Right? Can we help people who live very far away from a, a clinic, people who don't have the capacity to, to travel or maybe don't have the, the means to travel? Can we put these devices um, remotely in their homes and help them get access to care? So yeah, we, we have, um, and I've been involved in, in, in utilizing these from a scientific and a, an, actual, an actual clinician uh, perspective. Great, well with that, yeah, that sounds just, it sounds ideal if you can get these devices and offer these devices to people who, who need them. And like you're saying, mobility and transportation are a big, yeah. big hurdle to people with stroke survivors and brain injury survivors. Mm -hmm. and, other spinal cord, for example. Oh, other, exactly. Yeah. And other, other orthopedic injuries. And the other, the other really, the other really um, kind of important thing about the device itself. I mean, um, you know, I think one of the actually very um, first questions you asked was, what other types of devices are out there? Um, yeah. The there there are hundreds of robotic devices out there. Um, um, uh, we actually did a, a, a review chapter um, several years ago now, where we identified well over two hundred and fifty devices. Um, in the world, um, and, and and this is Nick in a, on, on an academic yeah pursuit, yeah an academic yeah. pursuit yeah where we were reviewing just trying to figure out what is out there, um, and there's a lot. Uh, the vast majority of these devices are sort of um, at the scientific project phase where there's like a one-off device in someone's lab in some in some institute right there's one or two of these one, in the world yeah and, and, exactly and you know there's two people that know how to build them and yeah. you have to kind of tr fly to the yeah. institute yeah. Of, of robotics at yeah. you know at wherever yeah. Yeah. yeah wherever whatever university yeah um, to, to try it and so, so there are a lot of devices and there are there are even a number of um, let's say larger scale devices um, um, so maybe consumer um, uh, large-scale types of devices um, but most of them are dedicated to be used in the in the clinic, um, or maybe in the, in, the, in the university hospital system. Um, there aren't any other devices out there that are active assist robotic devices uh, that have the scientific backing that are able to be used in the, in, in the home and a fully telehealth platform. This is the only one um, that's out there right now. Yeah, and then and, and so, this go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm uh, yeah, it's uh, just to go off that point um, uh, to, to, to add to it. Um, yeah, we the Modus Dova uh, hand mentor and foot mentor. Um, uh, we're an FDA class one device, so we've been through um, uh, many clinic, several clinical trials. Uh, the largest of which was a randomized control trial uh, done uh, uh, at Emory University here in Atlanta, and also the, uh, with the, the site at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, in, in Cleveland, Ohio, um, great national, you know, uh, top national hospitals. And um, uh, all of these robotics uh, talk about getting access as one of their goals, right? When you, when you propose these ideas, and giving access to more patients is at the heart of a lot of these pursuits um, in robotics. 
Uh, but we, we really took that idea to heart. And not only did, uh, uh, was designing a robotic device that was clinically, scientifically sound, uh, but it also needed to be operationally um, and, and financially sound. I mean, it's uh, money. I, we haven't really talked about that yet today, but and I, I think that, um, you know, as with many of these technologies that are talked about, these great new technologies, um, often what's overlooked is how much it costs. Um, some yeah. of these great, uh, you know, flying cars, you know, we, I see those, but yeah. when you, when you try to figure out, how, well, you know, is that practical? Yeah, what, are the, what are the economics behind this? N- yeah. There's no, yeah, I'm not, you know, there's no, I'm, gr- I'm glad that we can fly around the moon. I can send people around the moon, but that's not, uh, space tourism is happening, but that's not something that's, that's accessible, generally speaking, to the, to the public. So we, we really took that accessibility um, to heart, not only building a robot, that uh, would be able to help clinicians provide a um, higher level and greater amount of care um, with the limited time that they have. Uh, we also really uh, 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 looked at and emphasized um, the financial cost, the pain, financial burden, I should even say, um, to uh, both uh, the patient and, and to clinicians. Um, and, and, and currently how we are partner, partnering uh, with clinics in our telehealth model, um, we are actually providing the device um, uh, uh, to uh, clinics and clinicians to use with their patients. And um, there's no upfront charges. There's no, there's no, they don't have to buy a device. Um, uh, there, there's no, you know, a month, there's no monthly fees or anything like that. Uh, for clinics and clinicians, it's uh, actually um, uh, a, a, a uh, charge as part of the reimbursement that, um, uh, well, the, they pay, the clinics pay for the device out of the reimbursement that they get for the telehealth session that currently um, Medicare and most major, uh, just about every large major insurance provider is, is currently paying for for telehealth. And what that means is that uh, because the cost of the device is is coming out of the reimbursement that clinicians are getting for the telehealth sessions that they're doing, um, it, this, this service is actually completely free to the patient, to the individual. Um, if, if, uh, uh, they, uh, if anybody is, you know, if a patient is interested in getting a, a modus uh, hand bent or foot mentor device today, uh, we actually would just help partner them uh, or, or put them in contact, I should say, with one of our uh, clinicians and clinics that we partner with. Um, and they would be able to just get this um, device as part of the treatment that they would already get through the telehealth um, uh, with their uh, physical therapist um, or, or, or occupational therapist or, or clinician, I should say. Um, and, and clinicians can also, you know, there are, we get clinicians that contact us all the time that, that say, hey, I, I've heard about your device. Or even there's, there are cases where um, their patients will, will, will yep. uh, tell their clinicians about the device. Um, um, or they'll, they'll see it in some research publication and um, they'll, they'll be able to, um, you know, we'll be able to train them mm-hmm. uh, remotely um, and, and get them started within a, a, kind of a week or a so, week or so yeah. to, uh, to being able to deploy these devices to use um, for their patients. Yeah, and it can also help, um, you know, skilled clinicians and providers um, maintain those caseloads, right? Because Dave said earlier on that, you know, there are these density problems in clinics where there may be, you know, you may not be able to have X number of, um, of, of, of uh, clinicians there, and you may have a reduction in the number of patients that are allowed to be there. And so you can use telehealth as a way to maintain caseloads or keep people on caseload if they're, um, you know, if you already have an existing relationship and they're just not comfortable coming into the clinic because of, you know, fears of, of, of COVID. Um, and so it can help um, existing relationships and maintaining those relationships over these challenging times. Yeah, if, if a patient was coming in um, and now, now because of COVID, they can't get transport or they don't feel comfortable yeah. um, with doing in-person sessions because many of these stroke survivors are in these high-risk uh, categories. Yeah. They're on the older side. They, they have uh, Some comorbid conditions. Comorbid yeah. conditions, that's right. Um, and, uh, and they're forced to choose between getting health care and also their own health of possibly getting infected uh, with COVID. Um, you know, this is uh, our device, the, 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 the hand mentor and foot mentor, um, has been a great solution mm-hmm. to help bridge that gap, to help clinicians continue to, uh, to treat uh, and, and uh, uh, 
their patients and deliver care and, and also getting reimbursed for the services that, that they're providing. Because it does, I mean, if we're honest about it, it has to work for everyone involved, right? Yeah. It has to work for the providers and it has to work for the, um, for the patients. Well, speaking of which, actually, uh, how intuitive is this? Device? Is it a, Nick, you're a, you're a physiotherapist, so how intuitive, how intuitive That's a great is this question. device that you taught to teach physiotherapists yeah. to use? Yeah, this is a good question. I think one of the other, um, I'll quickly go back to what Dave was saying in terms of it has to be an effective device and it has to be economically feasible. The other side of that equation is kind of rounded off is it has to be um, intuitive, it has to be engaging, it has to be easy to use in the home. Right, because now we don't we don't have the um, I guess um, the ability to have someone there to technically help someone put it on. Um, so right. the, we've we've designed many of our design sort of vectors have pointed us to make something that is really really easy to use. That's the donning and doffing process. How hard is it to put on and take off, um, and how how easy is it to navigate the actual interface? Um, and we've we've spent many many months, many many hours trying to make sure these things are as easy to use as possible. Not only on the patient facing side, but also on the clinician facing side, on the provider side. Yeah. So we have done a number of things to make the, the sort of interfaces between the data that the device can capture and what the provider sees. We've, we've done a lot of filtering to make sure that um, they're seeing a lot of relevant information. Um, and try to make it as, as intuitive as possible. And, and not too much information as yeah, well. That, yeah. That's another part of it, it right? It can be overloaded. Because, because we're drawing in all this data. Um, uh, 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 perhaps a pitfall is uh, presenting too, too much. much data and not enough yep. of the relevant data. Yep. So, so for, in regards to the clinician dashboard, uh, that, that what the clinician uses to control, to remotely control uh, the robotic device, um, uh, it's uh, really been designed and geared towards clinicians. It's been designed by by a clinician, yep. um, and uh, um, and we've gotten great feedback from the clinicians that currently use it uh, uh, in order to make it kind of uh, as effective as possible um, in in terms of uh, allowing them to uh, allowing clinicians to, to practice uh, uh, their skilled care. Um, and then on the on the patient side, uh, right? This is. We, we say robotics, we say exoskeletons, that say AI, that can be intimidating. Um, yeah. But I, I will say that, you know, yeah, like Nick said, we've spent many hours making sure that um, it is it is very user friendly. So we have individuals ranging um, from as young as I think five years old. Five years old. That was our yeah. Five years old to uh, ninety eight years to old. To ninety eight years old was our oldest individual. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that and we we we've had individuals we've had uh, uh, users have never turned on a computer before. We've had that comment. I've never turned on a computer before. Yep. Am I going to be able to use your device? <laughs> yep. And um, we said we think you'll be able to do it. Um, and, and lo and behold, um, they were able to, I mean, simply take the device out of the a box, the brown brown box that's delivered by a UPS or FedEx. Um, they, uh, you just take it out. You plug it into the wall. The, 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 the power cable still is, you know, your familiar power cable. You plug into the wall, you turn it on, and then there's a... Uh, a screen, uh, uh, it's a 20, 22 inch high definition screen that, that, that immediately will, through video tutorials, kind of walk you through exactly what you need to do to put on the device. And so we, we've had a, a pretty good success with deploying these devices to a whole range of ages and a whole range of um, technology uh, fluency. Uh, fluency. That's good. Techno yeah, technology <laughs> fluency um, uh, to, to great success. Um, and, and like Nick said, that, that certainly is another pillar that we focused on because, uh, you know, we, we, we really believe that um, the delivery of this care needs to be patient-centered. Um, just because you have a, a, a great scientific uh, uh, device, but, you know, if it's too expensive or it, it, you, no one knows how to use it uh, or you can't get it to users, um, it's not, at the end of the day, it's not useful. So, so we've, we've really taken to heart to addressing um, each, each of these issues and, and uh, we've, we've had uh, uh, quite a bit of success thus far in, in kind of uh, getting, getting um, users up to speed and, and getting better with um, mm -hmm. on our, our telehealth platform. And that's, that's one of the things that um, Modus, the company, really prides itself on. We are, we are here to help make that telehealth delivery method as fluid and as seamless as possible. We, we realize that this often is the first time people may be doing things, clinicians may be doing things. So our, our job here is to make all of those technical and logistical considerations 
um, uh, you know, reduce the complexity as, as much as we can. So when we when we engage with sort of these these patient and uh, provider dyads, we make sure that all the technical details are handled. Right. We we make sure that. The, the patient knows how to operate the Wi-Fi, how, how to operate the device itself in a technical way, how to put the device on, as yep. well as providing yep. the in-depth training for a provider that may not have any experience with robotic devices or telehealth. So we provide education to get everyone up to speed so we can be really su- successful in this, and, in this delivery. And method. all of this education um, can, is, is currently done completely remotely. Yep. Uh, we are edu- we're sending devices to users, and they're being trained and onboarded uh, with never without ever at any point having direct mm-hmm. uh, uh, face-to-face contact with any other individual. Uh, for clinicians, we're able to train them as well um, uh, remotely. I mean, it's kind of the, I guess the, it's it's a uh, it's. Uh, people people it's uh, I don't know it's paradoxical but um, it's it's kind of uh, almost uh, uh, by definition uh, kind of thing where because we're doing a telehealth delivery service um, we actually want to train the individual the clinician uh, with telehealth mm-hmm. uh, th- remotely because that's how they're going to be delivering yep. the care um, if if we had them come in and a lot of clinicians ask you know, well I you know you're in Atlanta how do I you know how do I get trained with this and and um, it's it's uh, um, it's not intuitive maybe at first but no we, we don't physically come here. We'd like for you. Uh, we'll send you a device, and we can train you. We can, you know, you can be the the, the uh, see what it's like to be a patient, and then you can be uh, you can do a, you can do practice sessions uh, through our dashboard. Um, so very much uh, kind of uh, in terms of the onboarding process for both patients and uh, for users and for clinicians, um, bringing them up to speed is is something that that we're able to do uh, uh, with with ease um, to to most. Uh, to basically every individual that that we've um, we've come in we've come uh, with, in contact with thus far yep. in a range of uh, technological fluency yep. levels. Uh, great. Well, I don't want this device and this device sounds sounds incredible and sounds very helpful. I, I kind of I wish I had it when I was going through because I don't waste my life back at all. But uh, but yeah, but now that is great. Is there anything else that you would like people if people want to contact you or is there any more thing else with the device? If you want to contact, not necessarily you, but most know about, about this, my just in this device and the hand mentor, the foot mentor, or just the company, Modus Nova. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a that's a great question. You can, uh, 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 I encourage any, you know, anyone that's interested uh, to please go to modusnova.com. That's M-O-T-U-S-N-O-V-A.com. Um, and and uh, you can see a, a Kind of the device in action right there you know we're talking about this device uh, I, I always find it difficult um, mm-hmm. to describe it um, you know uh, 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 just kind of talking about it I think seeing I, it I is have, I have a picture in perfect yeah there's, there's yeah picture and video is worth a thousand words um, and, and you please call us um, you can call us at 404-738-5355 um, 404 738 5355. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, if that's if you're either a clinician uh, or, or a user that's interested in, in, in learning more or, or perhaps uh, integrating this into kind of uh, as an option to some of your users, uh, as a clinician, as an option to some of your patients, or as a patient, um, you want to, uh, uh, you know, kind of um, add this to your, your current therapy, um, uh, you know, please reach out to us, email, um, you can email us at support at modusnova.com. Um, and, uh, and we'll, we're happy to chat and, and, you know, kind of, um, uh, get you squared away and, um, uh, and seeing how we can help. Oh, great. Do you want to just repeat that number one more time or the address, the web address one more time, just so yeah, that was absolutely sure. It's um, so the phone number is four zero four seven three eight five three five five, and and that's a U.S. number, I should say. Um, and then you can also uh, go to m o t u s n o v a dot com. That's modusnova dot com. M o t u s n o v a. Um, and uh, uh, you can email us as well. Um, support as support as I don't know how to spell S U P P O R T support at modusnova.com um, and you know uh, whatever your concerns are your patient clinician mm-hmm. clinic owner or just just curious we're always happy to talk yep. um, and 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 uh, about how we can help oh, great this is a fantastic interview I love the uh, 
the combination of AI and, and the telehealth and the physical therapy and for brain injury specifically, that's just I think such a great fit. And uh, actually, I just have one one final question. Just ask you about where's where's the where is this now? Like, where do you where have you sold it? And where do you sell it? Generally, do you sell it to insurance companies? Insurance companies or the hospitals or the clinics? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So we um, we. Uh, uh, we have, we are selling the device to uh, clinics, to hospitals. Um, uh, there's a there's a map on our website of uh, the uh, about 200 locations. All the deployed uh, locations yeah. uh, across the country that have uh, clinics and hospitals that have modus devices. Some of the top uh, uh, um, hospitals, t- highest ranked, uh, nationally ranked hospitals in in the country has our devices. Um, uh, but I would say, prima currently, our biggest uh, demand for our device is um, in this telehealth setting directly to individuals, directly to patients. Uh, or to small uh, or clinics. To and directly to clinics, yep. yeah. Um, you know, uh, we, we deal with clinics that are um, uh, uh, that have 30 locations uh, with hundreds of clinicians. Um, and then we also deal with uh, clinics that have... Uh, one. Uh, we have yeah, one, maybe, uh, maybe one clinician. Single-run clinicians, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we don't just, you know, we love to work with everyone. Yep. Really, it's... Um, we, we firmly believe in, in trying to help uh, uh, clinicians and, and patients every, in every step of the way possible to kind of get them uh, treating and get them uh, better again. Okay, well, I, I, again, I think this is a great device. And uh, I don't uh, anybody to visit motisnova.com and find out more. And uh, thank you both, David and Nick. Yeah. Or Dr. Nick Housie, <laughs> CEO David Wu. And uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for having us. We had a, a fantastic time, and and uh, um, and uh, best of best of luck to all to you and and all of your listeners. Thank you. Very Thanks good. Stay well. safe. Thanks, Nick. You too. You too. I apologize for the recording. The recording, my recording software is MIA. I don't know where it is, or where I hit it, or deleted it, or whatever. But uh, thank you for listening so much, and thank you to Dave Wu and Nick Hasley. It was a great discussion. And please, I usually ask you to please listen to this and or view my website. But uh, in this instance, I would just like to ask you to please uh, subscribe or rate or both. That'd be great. Uh, my podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, Google Play, Stitcher. Spotify, and wherever else. And thank you all for listening. I hope you'll stay in soon. As always, music at the beginning of this podcast is by Ben Sound. www.bensound.com